everyone is watching and talking about Tiger King. It's a docu-series on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, you gotta watch it. Um, because I'm a wildlife biologist, everyone's asking my opinion about it, so I decided to make a series of videos all about the series, and of course relating to the animals, um, which the series um, didn't quite address. So as a wildlife biologist, I would love to address these major points and help you navigate the world of zoos and sanctuaries. I am Dr. Stephanie Shuttler, and my channel is all about empowering scientists and inspiring you to conserve the natural world. I am a wildlife biologist. I have been in this field since 2003. And I have my PhD. I um, worked in a zoo before. I worked in Disney's Animal Kingdom, which is an extremely nice zoo, probably one of the nicest. And um, I also conduct research in India um, using camera traps, and we definitely get tigers on our camera traps. Before I go into the specifics of um, addressing some of the issues on the Tiger King and the specific facilities, I want to go over what zoos are to begin with and the purposes that they serve for wildlife and people. Okay, let's just talk about what is a zoo and what's it for. Uh, originally, zoos were made just to display cool animals and people wanted to see those animals up close. Very little regard was taken for the animal's well-being um, or welfare. It, animals were pretty much just put in concrete cages. It was mostly for entertainment and um, for pure human enjoyment. Zoos today are used for entertainment. I know I go to the zoo for fun. Lots of people bring their kids to the zoos for fun. But over the years, if we've learned more about wildlife and their requirements, we have changed zoos a lot. And as the public has learned a lot more about animals, they've put pressure on zoos to change. And now you'll see a lot of zoos with more natural looking enclosures, enclosures, much larger spaces. A lot of times you won't even see the barriers. Um, they won't have bars on their cages anymore. So zoos are just fun to go to. That's one of their purposes as entertainment. Uh, another major role that zoos play is education. When you go to a zoo, a really good zoo will have signs talking about the animals, where they live, what they eat, um, and their conservation in the wild. Um, it's a really great place to learn about animals. And even if you don't go to the zoo, a lot of zoos provide really informative websites that tell you a lot of information about these cool animals there. The most important role for zoos, especially today, is their role in conservation. We are currently in a biodiversity conservation crisis. We are in the sixth mass extinction of species ever to happen on Earth. But the thing that's different about this one is that we are driving all of those extinctions. Zoos help conservation in multiple different ways. Seeing animals up close is an opportunity for people to interact with nature and develop connections to nature. Research suggests that one of the main predictors of people having pro-conservation attitudes and behaviors is strong connections to wildlife, especially when they are younger. So zoos can really provide that. They get you to look at the animals up closely, and if you see that animal and you fall in love with that animal, you are more likely to be motivated to care about all animals and nature in general. Part of the conservation crisis that we're facing is that people are now so removed from nature. Even myself, I spend by far a majority of my time indoors. Maybe I spend an hour outside a day when I walk my dogs. We're not getting these, these experiences with nature. And with these extinctions, it's called the extinction of experience, we are raising kids with every generation to have fewer and fewer experiences with nature, and therefore essentially raising generations of people to 
not care as much about nature. And of course, this threatens conservation. If people don't care about something, they're not going to be motivated to, to try to um, fix the problem. Zoos are also really important for conservation because they do captive breeding programs. And this comes with a caveat. You can't to be helpful for conservation, you cannot just willy-nilly breed endangered species. You have to breed endangered species with the intention that they will have homes when they grow up. Good zoos and ethical zoos do this. They make sure that the animals that they breed are important for the captive population. They maintain stud books, they know their genetics, so they're not just letting their animals breed. And what these captive populations do is they serve as sort of an emergency reserve of animals, essentially, if anything were to happen to that species in the wild. So for example, I worked at Disney's Animal Kingdom and we collected poop from cotton top tamarinds, which are a monkey that live in the country Colombia. They're only found there and they are critically endangered. If this population or this species were to become completely wiped out, say from a natural disaster, there would be zoo populations that, that scientists could potentially use to reintroduce the species in the wild and prevent it from going completely extinct. So these captive populations act as sort of um, an extra reserve um, in case of a, con a major conservation crisis. Now, that being said, you again, you just don't want to like captive breed endangered species without thinking about where those animals are going to go. And this is the argument that a lot of the facilities in Tiger King use. They say, okay, we're breeding these endangered species, but if there is a huge captive population of that species, you don't need to breed it anymore because those animals will not be reintroduced into the wild, which I will explain next. Um, there are actually more captive tigers just in the state of Texas in the United States alone than there are in the wild. We do not need more captive bred tigers. And responsible zoos, ethical zoos, they actually manage their animals um, so that they don't just breed um, uncontrollably. At Disney's Animal Kingdom, the reason why I was collecting poop from the cotton top tamarinds is because we were monitoring their... Um, their sex hormones. We had them on contraceptives because even though cotton tops are critically endangered in the wild, in captivity, they breed really well and they needed to be contracepted in order to stop unnecessary um, breeding. So we wanted to make sure the contraceptions were working and we analyzed the poop to look at their hormones. If species become so critically low in the wild, then zoos work with scientists to do species reintroduction programs. Now, species reintroduction programs only work if the threats in the wild are alleviated a little bit. So if the main problem for that species is habitat loss, or they don't have any habitat to live in now, adding more species is not going to help the problem. And that's actually what's going on with tigers in India, which I'll talk about later. So you need to make sure that there's habitat in place and that other threats might be reduced. If a species is being really poached, you don't want to reintroduce a captive bred species into a high poaching zone because you're just going to lose that species. To do a captive species reintroduction program takes a lot of work and a lot of effort by scientists and veterinarians. It's not just like you take that animal to its habitat, release it, and it does well, and it populates. It is not like that at all. And this is why the animals in Tiger King are not helpful for conservation. Those lions and tigers will never be sent to Africa and Asia, which would also be extremely expensive and stressful for the animals um, and be released to the wild. Any captive bred animal, even those that have more of a hands-off approach with their keeper, um, might not necessarily behave how the wild animal behaves. And in order for these reintroduction programs to be successful, the keepers need to make sure the animals have all the skills they need to survive in the wild. A great example of this was with black-footed ferrets. They were captively breeding them, but they weren't successfully hunting prairie dogs, their food, um, their normal food prey in the wild. And they had to design enclosures with live prairie dogs in them so they could get 
um, a chance to hunt them before they were released in into the wild. So scientists and the keepers made sure that they were able to hunt because otherwise, if they're not able to hunt, there's no point in reintroducing them into the wild. They're not going to survive and your reintroduction program is going to be a failure. So therefore, captive breeding is an extremely um, vigorous process. It's heavily researched, it is um, heavily monitored, and it is not always successful. It is definitely a challenge to successfully reintroduce species to the wild um, once they have been in such great decline or even extinct from that area. Good zoos and ethical zoos will also have conservation programs of their own. They will directly research animals in the wild or support conservation programs that help in their protection. A big problem with a lot of animal species is poaching. One of the ways to solve this problem is simply with anti-poaching patrols with rangers. Simply by having boots on the ground, people monitoring the area, collecting snares, um, just, I mean, monitoring the area and making sure that there aren't any poachers in the area, it really helps reduce the amount of poaching. That wraps up my brief introduction about the purpose of zoos and how it can help us through education, it can help animals through conservation. Next, we'll look at the structure of zoos, which will help you tell good from bad zoos um, because it can be a really difficult area to navigate. If you like this channel and you think it's helpful for people, please share it with a friend and please subscribe so you don't miss the next video. Bye.